All right, we are in yet again. What's poppin'? <laughs> so, I saw, I think it was a comment, right? Yeah, it was a comment. And someone was saying that something they view as a potentially interesting topic for me to cover would be building in Sword and Shield in you. And you know what? I agree. I think learning how to build in a tier is always a really helpful thing to be able to do. Helps you improve as a player because, well, I think at the end of the day, being a good battler can get you pretty far regardless in any tier. It's also really important to actually know how to build, I think. I think once you're a good builder, it just expands your knowledge of the metagame lore. And something that I've learned is I've played like certain, not like mainstream NU tournaments, I'm talking about like things like NU Classic, is that despite people being good players, they don't always know the tier they're playing, and that can give you an advantage over them. For example, I remember playing... This would have been last year's Indie Classic. It was an ADV, and my opponent... I caught them off guard with, like, offensive Wailord or something. They didn't know that Wailord ran that set, despite them having a team with it. Um, regardless, <laughs> I think it's very important to note something like that is important. Knowing how to build in a tier forces you to know how the tier works, forces you to become more acquainted with the metagame, what sets work, what Pokemon work well together, things of that matter. And so, I don't really know how in depth I can go with this video, but I am going to at least try to build like one team. I have an idea as to how I want to take this team, because I'm going to go over one of the easier builds in my opinion to craft. I don't think it's too hard to explain how to build certain teams, but I also want to give some like generic feedback, or at least just generic instructions, and I'll probably also go over a couple of the teams that I have in my builder, probably some old, some new, or newer, because let's be fair here, I don't want to have to build like three new teams just for a video, <laughs> I think that's a little bit annoying, and it doesn't really matter whether or not a team is more recent or older, the mechanics and practices that go into building teams don't really change over time. And so I think I can get away with using some of the older stuff in my builder too. But I do want to at least go through the process more live with you guys. I think that would help. And it also is good to see how people work. I think one of the ways that it's best to learn is from seeing someone that is more experienced just do it. Because you can be told how to do something, but that's not how everyone learns. Some people learn by watching, some people learn by doing themselves. Some people learn by a combination of the two. There's really no one correct way, and I'd like to at least be able to demonstrate one of them and maybe help the people that learn this way. And then the people that learn the other ways, well, maybe they can at least listen to this, see what I do, and then apply it themselves. That work for y'all? Good. It better work. <laughs> um, I do want to preface this by saying I don't script my videos ever. It's hard to script a PS Live anyway. But I, when I even just go off on tangents about the metagame, they're never planned. And while this video would probably benefit from scripting, like word for word, or not word for word, but more, what do I, how do I want to word this, more like structured scripting, I, I don't want to do that. I think that limits my ability as a content creator to be myself. I, I feel that I benefit a lot from when I just am allowed to say whatever's on my mind. I find myself a lot more pleasant to listen to that way, I would say. And while I do have a very loose, um, little thing that I want to go over that I wrote on a piece of paper. It, let's be real here, it doesn't really have much structure to it. There's not really even much on here. It's mostly just, here's some stuff you can talk about. <laughs> so we're going to go over this, I guess. Now, one of the first things I wanted to go over is just like generic information when you're building, right? And this could really apply to any tier, but I think it's important to go over this because to get good at team building in a specific tier, you need to know how to team build, like, in general. It's a lot easier to 
apply it to specific instances if you know how to do it just as a whole. And so one of the things that whenever I'm building, the first thing I ever do is I just look for something that I want to use. That could be a certain Pokemon, that could be a core of Pokemon. Well, the important thing is that you know what you want to start off with. So say, for instance, I wanted to build with, I don't know, the Wacky. You know, I'd put this in the Builder. And maybe I look for a core even to use. So, okay, Thwacky. This isn't what I want to build, by the way. It's just an example. Um, okay, so I look at Thwacky and go, all right, what can it do? Um, Grassy Surge. So maybe, I don't know, Grassy Seed Thievil with Unburden. It's something like that, where you just looked for a Pokemon or a core. You slap in your Builder, and this is where you start off with. You don't need to necessarily get the sets in place, but you just want to get an idea of what you're working with, because from there... It's best to then figure out the kind of archetype you're going for, because it's real easy to get down on paper what you want to use. The problem is, and I think a lot of people have this issue, is they'll try to apply Pokemon onto builds that they don't work. So for instance, I, if I were to go, okay, um, Thwacky and Thievil are weak to physical fighting types, so let's put, let me think of a really bad example here. Um, or they're weak to physical attackers, so let me put a Quagsire, and then, um, I'm trying to, keep in mind, I'm trying to, like, off my, top of my head go, how to make this really bad, and then, oh, this needs a flying resist, so let's put a Jolteon here, and then, oh, wait, I need a better ground type check, so, um, let's put a Rotom Fan here, and then, okay, well, I need Stealth Rock, so let's put a Clefairy, like, this is an atrocity, and while each of the Pokemon do technically, like, there was some progression going on there. It, this just is a hopeless mishmash of pieces that don't actually go together. Part of it's because I built without any real idea as to what core or what team build I wanted to go for. Something that's very important to remember is Pokemon don't just apply to any sort of build, right? You can't expect me to use something like, say, let's think, Aurora Veil vale Bomb. Eh, no, that's not a great example. You can't expect me to use something like, let's think of a really easy one. Maybe one that's even just on my screen right now. You know, guys, it's a lot harder than I thought. Um, what's a Pokemon limited to a certain type of build? I almost have it in my head. Clefairy. So this is a mistake that I made in NUPL this year. You can't expect me, me to put a Clefairy on an offense team and expect it to work. It, it just doesn't work like that. Clefairy is a horrible offense Pokemon. It gives up so much momentum because it just goes out there and it does nothing. It's too passive. It's too easily taken advantage of. It can't keep up momentum. It just sits there. It takes hits. Like, that doesn't work. And while, yes, maybe you have an offense core and Clefairy goes with it, but if you're trying to build offense, you got to keep in mind what say stealth rock setters work on offense so something like a pile of swine would have been better a golurk would have been better an offensive stealth rocker goes a lot better on an offensive team than just some passive do nothing pokemon so i think that's just something you always need to keep in mind not only do you need to have a good core that works together or just a certain pokemon that you want to use but you got to keep in mind what direction are you taking the team as a whole and of course this next point i had here kind of goes into what I was talking about, but you want to choose partners that do adequately support the core. You know, you don't want to just, like, go, okay, let me put six Pokemon together that fit on offense. You want to make sure that there's some synergy between them. So, you know, maybe I'm trying to build, I don't know, an Aurora Veil vale offense team, and I want to use Silvalli Ghost, and we'll just fill the Abomasnow in, because if we're using Aurora Veil, vale, there has to be an Abomasnow. If I want to put a Skuntank on here, I would need to be able to justify to myself, why am I using Skuntank? What does it help achieve for this team? Well, in this case, so Valley Ghost struggles with opposing ghost types, right? I mean, stuff like Scarf Rotom can outspeed and potentially KO you when you're chipped. Gorgeist Small just outspeeds and drops you with Poltergeist. And so, Skuntank's a good Pokemon here because it can switch into those Pokemon and check them. So there's just a generic example of that. Now, when you're looking to build, I think there's three general archetypes that you want to keep in mind. And that's going to just be offense, balance, and stall, right? The, these are, I took, I'm taking the two extremes. Yeah, I guess hyper offense would be the ex more extreme than offense, but 
I think these are just the three generic ones to keep in mind. There are variations, right? There's bulky offense, there's semi-stall, there's, again, hyper offense. But I think these are generally what you're going to be looking at when you're looking at building. And I want to look at offense this video. As I think offense is generally just a very easy team to build. Now, when you're looking at an offense team, whatever variation it is, some important aspects to combine is the offense is generally about keeping up momentum, right? Especially the frailer offense builds, you'll see like Aurora Veil, vale, Sticky Web, etc. These teams don't stack defensive Pokemon on them, you know, that's why they call it offense. Instead of balance or stall. They're all about just keeping up momentum through pivoting moves, through just taking out Pokemon, aggressive double switching, setting up and just applying pressure that way. You're trying to keep up per pressure. You're trying to keep up the pressure, you're trying to keep up momentum. You're trying to just force the opponent to play reactively to what you do. You want to be playing proactively. Whereas the build like Stall can afford to play reactively at times, although if you're a good Stall player, you will make those proactive plays. Offense is trying to always force your opponent to react. You need to keep the momentum in your favor because your team doesn't have great defensive utility to fall back on. Now, I did do an RMT for NU a couple of months ago, wherein I did go over the fact that NU, Hyper Offense at that time, and I think it still applies, it actually does have the benefit of being able to have these defensive Pokemon on them. And when I say defensive Pokemon, I don't mean you're slapping a Clefairy on the offense or like a Quagsire, but what I mean by defensive Pokemon is that the components of offense actually do a pretty good job of providing defensive utility. And so I think it's actually a pretty good build to show for this tier. And I think it could appeal to a lot of crowds. And so, some Pokemon that you'd call these on offense. So we talked about Veil of Bombastone. We talked about how you want to set up a lot on offense to just keep applying offensive pressure. So you have things like Sword Stance, Soul Valley Forms, you have things like Nasty Plot, Rotom, Nasty Plot, Toxicroak, Nasty Plot, Skun Tank, which is a really common one. Some of these like hyper offense builds you'll see like a lead Stealth Rock setter, like Dreadnought Curse, or just some Focus Sash Pokemon that's meant to get rocks up and then just, you know, do as much damage as it can before it faints. Unless Hyper offensive builds, though, maybe you'll say like a Stealth Rock Golurk or Piloswine, because these are just really strong Stealth Rock setters that do provide some defensive utility as well. But they've got more staying power, and they're able to still do the same as like Cursler or Dreadnought, but throughout the game. You'll also see like some Pokemon meant to keep momentum up on the less hyper offense, just more generic offense builds, so like something like Choice Band Lipard with U turn, something like Choice Scarf Basculin, or even Choice Band with Flip Turn. Something like Choice Scarf Togodomaru with U-Turn. Even something like a Hatchrim, right? With Healing Wish. We've seen Hatchrim run on earlier iterations of offense this generation, on like weather teams especially, like Sun. It really loved to have Hatchrim, just because a great way for offense to keep up momentum is through Magic Bounce. Being able to punish your opponent for trying to set up hazards by switching to your Magic Bounce user. That's something that Zatu did in Generation 6 and 7. Hell, even not to, when you would occasionally see it in Generation 5. It was a good magic bouncer. Or, good's a bit of a stretch, but it was a magic bouncer. These kinds of Pokemon help keep up momentum for your team, and make it a lot easier on you. You're not ever having to react to your opponent getting in an advantageous position, because you're trying to keep yourself in an advantageous position. And as we said earlier, there's a lot of variations of offense, right? There's just generic offense, but there's also stuff like bulky offense, there's sticky web, there's volt turn, there's spike stacks, there's aurora veil, there are a lot of options. And even if you look at my builder, I mean, there's even trick room if you really want to try that. Thank you, Coots, for his trick room too, by the way. I have still not won with it, but it's cool. Now this video, for the team we actually build, I want to go over spike stack offense. I think spike stack is just really nice to have in your builder. It's just a really reliable way of overwhelming opponents that aren't as skilled, I feel, <laughs> as you. Because what Spice Stack rewards is really proactive play, right? If you're able to always prevent your opponent from getting rid of your hazards, you're always going to be in an advantageous position. You're always forcing a whole bunch of chip damage on your opponent's Pokemon. And while the advent of Heavy Duty Boots does hurt that a little bit, it still isn't a deal breaker for these kinds of builds. And so let's let's get to spike stacks. So 
What do I got? It's spike stack. Now, keep in mind, this is going to be the part of the video where I really stop coherently speaking. So, I'm going to ask you to just bear with me here. I'm going to try my best. The team we make might not be the best. I maybe should have built it prior and just written down my thoughts on this paper. I didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> but so let's think about this. When we go about spike stack, obviously we need to start with a spiker. And there are a few options that fit on offense. The two being Frostlass and Quillfish. While there are other spikers like Crustal, which puke, or Pharaseed, Pharaseed doesn't really fit on this kind of build, right? And so we're going to be looking at one of Frostlass and Quillfish. Now, Frostlass, I like it. I think we could get away with it too. The problem is, is that the rockers on these types of builds, I don't think lend themselves to going with Frostlass very well. Unless you wanted to do like double suicide lead with both Frostlass and Dreadnought. I think you're really compromising yourself defensively otherwise. And so I'm going to suggest that we go with Quillfish. Quillfish in general is also really nice for the defensive utility that it offers these builds. It's a good check to physical fighting types. It also handles some of the Sword Stencil Valley forms, particularly Steel, when I think about it. And so, let's just get a nice little standard set in here. So we do have the helmet, and we get spikes. We want taunt, because we want to make sure that the opponent isn't able to clear our hazards. And then I'm going to just go Poison Jab Liquidation. There is a lot of move variations you can do with Quillfish. You can run Thunder Wave, you can run Toxic, you can run like Scald, you can run Destiny Bond, Paint Split. But I think on offense, this is probably going to be the best. And for EVs, um, we're just going to go with a nice little boring standard one. Actually, I think... So, we could do this build. But I believe you get more out of going Impish and then going like this. Yeah, I believe this gives you more overall bulk. It's not by much. I think it's actually by, like, a single point. But I don't see any real reason to not optimize your stats when you can. Stat optimization is just another little component of building that you pick up on over time. One of, And I think the main thing to remember when trying to optimize stats, it's a little awkward when the base stats are even. But generally what you want to do is you want to have the nature positively affecting the higher stat. That usually will result in gaining a bit more stat points. Sure, you may be able to hit the benchmark by putting a positive nature in a different stat. Like, as we saw, I was able to still get the speed I wanted, or the benchmark, which was being faster than 240 speed, when I had Jolly. But I believe this does give you a little bit more defense and so we're gonna go with this. Now, we went over good stealth rockers earlier to go on offense, right? We had lead Dreadnought, we had lead Cursla, we had Rocks Golurk, we had Rocks Pilus One. Now, I'm gonna suggest we go Rocks Pilus One here, and here's why. I think Golurk is a good Pokemon on these types types of teams, but I also think that Spike Stack doesn't really need a Scarfer. And instead benefits from just having a, several fast Pokemon and in priority. And I also think that lead Stealth Rock Setters, in Inu at least, are generally more favored to go on Aurora Veil. So we're going to go with a nice little pile of swine here. Um, for moves, we're just going to do like the most standard thing ever. Maybe we look back and change up the moveset a little bit later. Because you could go like Superpower here if you want to hit Rotom Frost. Opposing Piloswine, and I think there's a couple other Pokemon that Sprout is good for. Those are the ones that come to mind first, though. But I think this is just the easiest one to immediately put into the Builder. And we're going to go this EV spread. This just... The logic behind this spread is 232 plus is the amount of attack you need to KO 4 defense Flapple with Ice Shard guaranteed. The Flapple user might not always put it into defense those last little four EVs, but just to be safe, we always optimize for that. And then just some EVs in speed, because things like to try to outspeed Pilot Swine. You can go more speed. I see Pilot Swines like to speed creep Eldegoss and other base 60s. I think that's good if you have Icicle Crash, so that's an option if you want to go that way. You do end up, you end up wanting to take it out of HP and then just maximize attack. If you'd go that route. 
I, mean, I think this is just the easiest one to look at. And so now we've got our spike stack core right here, or our hazard stacking core. And now what we have to start asking ourselves is, okay, what Pokemon do we want that are really good at punishing the opponent for switching? What well, Pokemon really appreciates spikes weakening stuff? Now, when I think Kanga spikes, I don't really think this kind of build. I think Kanga spikes is generally more a balance build or a bulky offense build. The Kanga spikes team that I used, I would probably classify as a balance build. And so what we're going to try to go here for is something different. Now, we do need a few things t for this team for sure. We need to make sure that we have ways of threatening the common defoggers, and we have to make sure that we have a spin blocker of some kind. In my head, when I'm thinking spin blockers, I'm thinking already like Gorgai Small, I'm thinking Rotom, Silvalli Ghost, something like that. I don't think a Kofa would be too good on this team. I think it's too slow. I think it gives up momentum a bit too easily. Decidueye is an option, but I prefer Gorgeist on these teams more. Because I like having the faster option. You could go Sword Stance Decidueye with Sucker Punch, though. It's an option. But I want to go first. I want to get some pivoting onto this team. And I like Lipard for this role. I think it's pretty nice. Doesn't really all have to say, man. <laughs> it's a good Pokemon. It also helps pressure the opposing Ghost types. And having a Ghost type check. I would say is pretty mandatory. Now, remind, allow me to remember what moves this Pokemon runs. Um, Psycho Cut, I guess, for the last move. It doesn't really matter. Psycho Cut, Player of, both options. Lightbird's really good because a lot of its checks are going to be Pokemon that do not appreciate having to consistently switch into spikes. So we can help pressure those opponents, or foes, I guess, for Lightbird with that spike support. Also makes it really easier to spam knockoff against Silvalli. The Silvalli has no recovery, but it is a common knock switch in. And so having a lot of hazards up just makes it a lot more punishing to try to switch in a knock. And of course, like we said, we wanted a pivot Pokemon, and U-Turn just help out a lot with that. Now the reason I mentioned a Gorgeist and even Decidueye earlier is also, this is our water type resist right now. Oof, oof, yeah, it, it's not a good one. Gwilfish does not like having to take repeated hits from like a lantern, especially because it's just weak to Volt Switch. So I think having something like that is beneficial. We can even go Flapple, although that doesn't like dealing with AV Lantern as much. Because AV Lantern, of course, can run Ice Beam. Not gonna lie, a lot of these don't really love AV Lantern. AV Lantern's a pretty strong Pokemon. So we're thinking about an option here that does a f those. just that combination of things. We could also just bypass that problem for now. And I think I actually have a combination of Pokemon that I like here. Rotom and Rapidash. So why these two? Well, Rotom, it gives us a ground immunity. If we go Rapidash, yeah, we're really needing a ground immunity at the moment. You know, that's one, two Pokemon weak to ground. And Pylos 1, well, it can't switch into ground type moves. It's not like it's very consistent doing that. And so... Making it so the opponent literally just can't lock into, like, say, Earthquake with a Choice Scarf Tox Croak, it's really good. Now, for Rotom set on this team, I'm actually going to go with Choice Specs. I really like Choice Specs Rotom. It's really good at just punishing the hell out of switches. It's really hard. I think there's a couple options for set. You, you could get away with Nasty Plot, but again, we're just trying to break. For maybe like Rapidash to clean late game. Choice Band Lipard could even make use of its good speed. I mean, hell, even Rapidash could. And Rapidash, there's really only one set you could run on this Pokemon. And that's SD Blitz. High Horsepower, I think, is the best move right now. Lantern is the predominant bulky water type, I'd say, at the moment over Wishy Washy, so I don't think you really need Wild Charge. And morning, so it's just good, so this can actually switch into like a couple weaker resistant attacks. And now, would you look at that? We're almost done with this team. Again, I don't know how good this team is going to be, because I'm not going to be able to really test it too much. Maybe I'll get a game with it. But we do know the last mod needs to be something that can help us out versus like, I don't know, man, water types. 
<laughs> I mean, Drodum's helpful, but we still don't have anything that takes water type moves. We do have a Silvalli slot open. We could do Silvalli Dragon here. Gives us a grass resist as well, another water resist. Kind of like the idea of Silvalli Dragon. Hmm. Yeah, guys, you liking that? As an option? Because I think I do. Also, benefits from Rapidash helping check like Clefairy and Alchemy a bit. I mean, Silvalli Dragon can mow down most Clefairy just by using plus two Iron Head anyway. I think it's good. It also gives us a more like stout win condition. So let's go with the just most generic set we can. Oh, I was about to U-turn on this. Flame charge is the better move though for sure. And so we got a. If you look at this team, we got a lot of the things that we wanted, right? So we got our spike stacking here and just hazard stacking as a whole with these two. We got some priority as well. We got just generic fast bonds for speed control. It's more here. We got Volt Turn here, which synergizes super well with stacking hazards. And we got like a lot of just set up with these two. These two can really help muscle through stuff. These two also are just great wall breakers. Overall, I think we've hit a lot of the marks we want. Now, for me to just look at this team real quick, is there anything in specific that we're just missing? I think you could argue that we're kind of weak to like... Kofa. Because we're kind of weak to Kofa, you could argue for a few changes. Actually, though, are we really? It's mostly we're like kind of weak to Trick Room Kofa. Hmm. So, if you're worried about being weak to Trick Room Kofa, a change you could do is go Toxic over Poison Jab on this. It just makes the matchup trivial. So long as it doesn't get a boost. Like, I mean more special attack boost, because you could handle body press trick room Kofa just fine, but if it's like nasty room, that's a bit rough. <laughs> it's a bit rough to say the least. <laughs> um, yeah, this handles rest Kofa very fine. We don't have great poltergeist switch ins, but like Pylo can check for us last pretty adequately, I would say. And also having max HP just makes us a better response to it. This is about 300 defense with the Divilite, so that's pretty cash, pretty cash. Hmm. I mean, just looking at this team, I think it is pretty functional at the least, right? Very much a team that you have to play proactively with. Part of me wants to make this a Flapple, man. I, I really want this to be a Flapple. I think Savali Dragon's better, just because it does... It's not punished as heavily by Ice Beam from Lantern. I do think if you wanted to use like Dragon Dance, Lumberry, Flapple though, I think that could work. I am just trying to throw out like other options there as I go through this building process in case you want to make some other adjustments. Flapple's also nice because it gives another like ground resist, which is always really helpful to have. I'm just thinking about other Pokemon that are common right now. Gallade, annoying, but everything on the team outspeeds it. At least the four offensive Pokemon, so unless it's like Scarf Glade, then you're good on that front. This at least switches into CC, this switches into like Zen Headbutt. Um, Knock, I mean both of these can deal with Knock. So I don't think it's an unwinnable matchup even against something like Scarf Glade. Hmm. Weezing is annoying, but manageable, I think. Psycho Cut is nice also because it hits Weezing a little bit harder, and obviously Choice Specs Rotom applies immense amounts of pressure to Weezing. And just by Swords Dance boosting, you could probably force a lot of damage onto Weezing, so I don't think it's really that unmanageable from that front either. Another nice thing about building, I think, is something to do is just look through the tier list or the viability rankings thread, which isn't updated at the moment. I do have a link I could show y'all. I guess I probably will show y'all that. Something to do when building, and something that's really, I think, important is make sure that you at least have a game plan versus every top tier thread, right? I think a team can look weak to something, but if you at least have an idea as to how you need to play against it, it's helpful. So for example, if this team had no way of switching into, like, well, it's like a Pokemon we don't switch into well, um, opposing Rotom could be annoying to switch into, right? And so... I think if you were to see a Rotom on the other team, 
Consider leading with Silvalli Dragon against it, or like a Lipard. If it's Scarf, then yeah, it's going to be faster than you and Volt, but then you at least have a better idea how to play against it from there. But if it's like Specs Rotom, I mean, it's claiming one every time it comes in, right? At least it's claiming a lot of damage on something. And so, you'd say, okay, well, I don't want my opponent leading with that, so I'm going to lead off with Lipard. And so, let me see, um, does this... Alright, cool, yes, this does follow. So, here is... My perception of the viability of Pokemon in tier right now. We are working on a viability rankings update. That'll be out soonish. And this is just how I wanted to organize the Pokemon before I voted on the slate to place everything. Because I figure this organizing stuff like this is going to help me visualize it more. So as you see, S rank, I have these three Pokemon right here. I probably won't show the whole thing. But I have these three as the S ranks because I think Tkofa is still ridiculously good. It walls like half the tier and it's got nasty setup sets. Glade, Scary Wall Breaker, Toxicroak, Scary Wall Breaker, slash Setup Sweeper. And you get these Pokemon, Decidueye, Scary Wall Breaker, also pretty good utility. Kenga, good Wall Breaker, double priority is great. Has some defensive utility just because it's a normal type. Piloswine, in my opinion, is the best Stealth Rock Center tier. It also has like Ice Shard, which is cool. Rotom, great Wall Breaker, great Revenge Killer if you choice Scarf. Savali so Dark and Dragon both run really strong Sword Stance sets. Galarfisk, second best Stealth Rock in my opinion. Good check to stuff like Rotom. Weezing, amazing. Oh my lord, I love it. It's been a godsend for the tier. And it's just a generically great physical wall that also is a ground immunity, which we have been needing more of. And you got like Clefairy, I think it's one of the better utility Pokemon of the tier. Grice Small, really good wall breaker, can run choice scarf sets. Lantern, best defensive water in the tier. Rapidash, really good sword stance Pokemon. Rotom Fan, really good utility Pokemon. Sandaconda, I would say it's fallen from grace a bit more recently, as the tier favors more offensive builds and it doesn't fit on super well. So Valley Steel, it's like the third best Soul Valley form. It's mostly just because it's handled by more um, defensive Pokemon, so its setup sets aren't as scary. But I think it has potential maybe with like utility sets like Toxic, Parting Shot, and Defog, stuff like that. And then Skuntank, I think A is probably high compared to where a lot of other people have Skuntank. But I really value defensive utility on Pokemon in this current meta. And the fact that this can be so potent as a setup Pokemon while still supporting the team really well defensively is a big boon in my eyes. And now I'll just like quickly look or scroll through how I have these other Pokemon ranked. You could agree or disagree with my rankings, of course. This is my opinion at the end of the day. Anything that's not on here, of course, I don't think should be ranked. But I think looking at the viability rankings thread as you're building, seeing where certain Pokemon are viewed in terms of how good they are, and then seeing how does your team, once you've built it, match up against those threats. I think those are some steps that you should always look to take when building. It just It's a great way to ensure that your team is more solid than it otherwise would be, and that you can at least ladder more consistently. Form a game plan with your team before you can start laddering. Figure out how am I going to deal with each of these threats. If there's a Pokemon that you come across when looking at the VR or when looking down here that you just say, okay, there's literally no way for me to deal with this, or like my ways of dealing with it are so inconsistent, well, maybe you need to make some changes to your team, be it like teching something on your set, like say, you know, maybe I want, I don't know, Toxic on this instead. That's an option. Or if it's just replacing a full Pokemon, like say maybe, oh, Rotom isn't the um, wall breaker I want here, I want a, I don't know, a Decidueye. That's an option too. I'll even make the change in my builder just to truly demonstrate that I am not going to, you know, just say that and then not actually do it. I don't think, I don't know if Decidueye is actually any better of a fit here or not, by the way. You know, we could do like a, I don't know, Choice Specs Decidueye. You know, that can work. Sure. You know, guys, this is the team. There are plenty of variations of this team that we saw in this live. I'll, I'll probably just include this one here. But you could look back in the video if you want to edit one of the other ones in. And I also want to just look at like another team that I built and just explain maybe some rationale. So let's look at the Kanga Spikes team, right? So when I went to this team, my idea was, okay, I want to use Kanga Spikes. That, that, that's literally it. 
And I was thinking, all right, well, this probably could be a really easy balance team to make. So we get this core right here. These are, I think this is probably the standard set for each of these Pokemon. Adamant's probably the better nature on this, but team dependent thing I figured once I was done building, Jolly would be better. And we go, okay, so this team has absolutely no way of switching into a fighting type move. So, hey, there's a fighting immunity. Choice Scarf Rotom is also just really good because it can cripple some of the things that Kangaskhan doesn't love dealing with, like Pharisee, like Galar Stunfisk, which jerk. It's also good at pressuring ghost types. And while Kangaskhan does have Scrappy, meaning it can hit ghost types with double edge, something like Kofagregis, it, it does not take much from double edge. So that was a pretty good pair. And then this is just a nice defensive core that I thought would be cool to run. AV Lantern helps pressure stuff like Sandaconda and Pylosaur as well, which can maybe take some double edges from Kanga. And then Rock Fairy Knockoff helps cripple some stuff that maybe switches into Kofa. And also provides Stealth Rock to further chip the opponent's team down. And the last slot, I was like, oh, Toxicroak is the Dangermon. And I was like, oh, let's run my own Toxicroak, because it kind of checks Toxicroak, right? Not gonna lie, the Toxicroak matchup for this team is horrid, and really the only way of playing into it is just preventing it from switching in. Like, you see, that's something that I've acknowledged with this team. It's something that I know I need to be prepared. Every time I see a Toxicroak, I need to immediately figure, okay, how am I dealing with it? Usually that's through, like, leading with, like, my Kanga, and just saying, okay, no, you're not doing anything turn one. And then just doing my best to prevent it from switching in, which isn't always possible. You know, if someone gets a U-turn off versus, say, my Ferris Seed or Lantern, then, well, it's gonna... Dangermon is in, Dangermon is now. There's not really much that I can do about that. But I at least have some sort of idea as to what I want to do. But guys, I think that's gonna be where I'm gonna end this video. I might make some other how-to build videos. This is like how to build, you know, spec stack offense in Inu with some general tips. Maybe I look at Aurora Veil, maybe I look at, God forbid, Stall. Not gonna lie, I've not built Stall ones. Um, I have a semi-Stall build here, like Dub Wool. I don't know if this team's any good. I'll like just go over the sets if you wanna try to like rob them. I don't know how I feel about that team overall, but like that's really the closest thing to stall that I've made this generation so far. And I don't know how particularly good I view that team. I think I tried laddering it with it, and it felt really bad. So it might not be a very good team. <laughs> but I, I do hope you all found this video somewhat informative. I'm not against making videos like these in the future. But anyway guys, that's going to be it for me for this time. I'll see you all next time. Peace.